I want to start by saying a little bit more about what I said with n equals 2 at the end of the last video. There was already a question on that one. Um, I was saying that essentially 2 is a perfect square in z of i. That's not literally true. That's why I put the essentially in there. Um, so let me just say a couple things. It's surprising enough that 2, which was prime in the ordinary integers, becomes divisible by anything in the Gaussian integers. And it's, it's very uh, cool that it be becomes divisible by a perfect square. It turns out to be the only one uh, that's that, that has that true about it. So the fact that 1 plus i squared is a factor of 2 at all is interesting. But the fact that this is a unit, this minus i is invertible, uh, means that it's even more special. The a more precise way to say why units are unimportant in this context, they can be important in other contexts, is that we care most about divisibility. Um, and one way to talk about divisibility is to look at a number and look at the set of numbers that are divisible by that number. So let me give you an example in the ordinary integers real quick. Let's look at the set of n such that it's div all integers n, plus or minus, that are divisible by minus 4. Well, if you think about it for a sec, that's exactly just the multiples of 4. Um, it's the same set as, as the, uh, the integers that are divisible by 4. And you can translate from one to the other just by multiplying or dividing by minus 1. And it's crucial that you can divide by minus 1 to go back and forth. Similarly, uh, in the Gaussian integers, if you look at the set of Gaussian integers that are divisible within the Gaussian integers by this thing, minus i times 1 plus i squared, which is a way to write the number 2, it turns out to be exactly the set that's divisible by these guys. So that's the sense, the precise sense in which 2 is acting like a perfect square. That the set of things divisible by 2 um, in the Gaussian integers are the same thing set as divisible by this particular perfect square. We're not going to take that uh, really any further, I think, but it's a, it's a very cool thing. And there's definitely a lot more you can do with it. Um, I want to clear up a few other things that came out of the numerical investigations uh, here. Um, we noticed that 2 was a sum of squares, and 5 was a sum of squares, and 10 was a sum of squares. And in fact, we could make the representation that works for 10 out of the representations for 2 and 5. And that's quite general. So let's do a little algebra with complex numbers to show that. Um, it's The key is that we can multiply complex numbers, that these pairs, when you represent 2 or 5 or 10 as the sum of two squares, you're really using a single object, the complex number, like a plus bi or x plus yi. And you can combine those those pairs in a very interesting, nice way, namely multiplying complex numbers. The other key thing is that conjugates behave well. Because uh, we've seen that um, to express, for example, 10 as the sum of squares, we take a complex number and multiply it by its conjugate. So let's see how those two, con uh, those two concepts, multiplication and conjugates, um, interact with each other. Well, there's a very straightforward proof that the product of two conjugates is the conjugate of the product. And you can just stare at that and verify all the, the steps there, which is basic stuff about complex conjugates and multiplication. Therefore, um, the squared magnitude, and which remember you can think of as geometry. I'm not emphasizing the geometry in this in these lectures, but uh, there's a lot of cool geometry here. Um, the squared magnitude you can think of as being built entirely out of the concepts of multiplication and conjugate, and so it's going to behave well too. Namely, the squared magnitude of the product of two numbers is the product of the squared magnitudes. Okay, so that's nice for just like consistency and everything has like simple relationships to each other. But what's what's the payoff? It's very direct. Suppose that m and n are good, that is, they're ordinary integers that can be expressed as a sum of squares. Okay, well, we now think of that as saying that m is the squared magnitude of a complex number w, where that's a plus bi. n is the squared magnitude of z, where z is x plus yi. And so when I take the product of m and n, oh, I'm taking the product of two squared magnitudes. That's the squared magnitude of a product. Oh, okay, that's the sum, that's the sum of squares of two other numbers, where c and d are the real and imaginary parts of the product of w and z. What are those explicitly? OK, I had to pause there for a minute. Um, so what are these c and d? Well, they're just given by multiplying these complex numbers, w and z. So the c is ax minus by, and the d is ay plus bx. It's not really crucial that we kind of look at those formulas. The main thing is to know that there are some c and d. Um, but let me say another word about it. Even if you never heard about complex numbers, you can express this t purely in terms of real numbers. It's an interesting identity. It's a good thing to, you know, funky thing to have uh, 
high school algebra student prove um, that if you take the sum of two squares and another sum of two squares and you multiply them, that can be expressed as the sum of two other squares where you get these kind of unexpected funky combinations of a, b, x, and y. You can prove this by just expanding out the left-hand side and you get some interesting cancellations. But it's very random if you don't know about complex numbers. Um, it's actually a, a very, very natural thing when you express this all in the Gaussian integers, um, even though you don't absolutely have to. So the upshot, of course, is that when I have two good numbers, the product is going to be good. It can be expressed as the sum of two squares as well. Um, what this, one of the things this suggests is let's not worry about composites too much, okay? Let's worry about the primes in the ordinary primes in the integers, um, and then figure out composites later. And in fact, I'm not even going to go, go and do the whole comp story of the composites. It's not super uh, complicated once you understand the primes. So that's one reason, and we'll see other reasons, why we'd want to focus on the primes, okay? So from now on, we're pretty, get pretty much going to say, um, I've got a prime number, an ordinary prime integer. Can it be expressed as the sum of two squares? Okay, so there's another piece of unfinished business from the numerical um, examples. That was about 3 and 7. Um, what we know is just by a very, very, very simple trial and error that they don't, they're not the sum of two squares. So in terms of Gaussian integers, that says they don't factor in this special way as a number times its conjugate, like u, u bar. Um, but we might want to know if they factor. We're, we're getting a hint that the better we understand the Gaussian integers in general, and especially the idea of factorizing um, in ca Gaussian integers, we, we might really need to know that, even though uh, we think we only need care about these factorizations. Well, it's not a hugely hard exercise, and I'm not going to do it, um, to show that, in fact, they don't factor at all. Um, and so, so that, in fact, if you have two Gaussian integers, um, if their product is a random Gaussian integer, then it, it's kind of complicated to analyze, and we'd have to go into that more. But if their product is known to be a positive real number, like 3 or 7, then it turns out it's not hard to show that x plus yi is pretty already pretty close to being the conjugate of a plus bi. It has to be just a real multiple of the conjugate of a plus bi. Good way to show this is using the polar form of a complex number, by the way. Now, in our situation, we're actually even more special. This is the first place we're going to take advantage of the fact that we're now thinking just about primes. Um, we're only worrying about looking at sum of two squares for primes, if the product happens to be a prime number, it's a very special kind of positive real number, and here's an exceptional case that we often have to deal with, um, if they're not units, which is just pretty trivial. We don't, we're not really pretty particularly interested in the plus or minus one, plus or minus i kind of factorization, then it turns out that in fact x plus yi has to be the conjugate exactly. So the upshot is, if you do this exercise, or if you just trust me, then the only non-trivial way that an ordinary prime p can factor in the Gaussian integers is as u, u bar, okay? So again, we're seeing some payoff from this uh, simplification already of looking at primes. Um, and it's really, really interesting about these words primes and factorizing, factorization. That was, that's what we seem to be led to, is understanding that better in the Gaussian integers. Okay, so um, we still didn't have a good guess from our table before as to which numbers actually uh, can be expressed as the sum of two squares. But let's just look at the primes now. It's going to be another really big payoff, excuse me, uh, for looking at the primes. So now two, we already see that that's we've already seen that's pretty special, and so this might not be part of a pattern, and that's very 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 common. It's the only uh, even prime, and so it does not. Um, it is, I'm sorry, this should be a yes. Of course, it's, it does factor. Um, it's a yes, but it might be special. Okay, now 3 doesn't, 5 does, 7 doesn't, uh, 11 doesn't, 13 does, 17 does, 19 doesn't. And you could go on, and if you want to test more cases, that's cool. Um, but you probably want to pause right now and, s and ask yourself, do you see a pattern that's similar to the one that we found for the difference of squares? Now, that pattern worked for all numbers, not just primes, but here, Let's see if, it, if something similar at least works for primes. So pause the video because I'm going to reveal. And it's because they're periodic, okay? The bad ones are the ones that are of the form 4k plus 3. The good ones are of the form 4k plus 1 and 2, which we already expected was probably going to be special, okay? But among the odd primes, if you look at 3 and 7 and 11 and 19, those are all one less than a multiple of 4, or equivalently, 3 more than a multiple of 4. And the ones that are good are the ones that are 1 mod 4. The remainder when you divide by 4 is 1.
Okay. Now, this is not a proof. I've only gone through 19. That's a ridiculously small amount, even by sort of experimental standards. Um, but it turns out that that is the pattern. That's really what, what happens. And we can already say something in pretty basic, um, using pretty basic mathematics, to suggest that that's we're really on the right track. Um, the good ones seem to be, the odd primes that are good, seem to be the ones that are congruent to 1 mod 4. And in fact, without any fancy stuff, Gaussian integers, anything like that, it's easy to see why 4k plus 3 actually has to be bad. And that's just good old-fashioned casework. If you look at um, what are all the things that can be expressed as a sum of two squares, well, either the a and the, the x and the y that you're squaring are either both even, or one even and one odd, or both odd. Okay, if they're both even, then you get a multiple of 4, and that's 0 mod 4. Okay. If 1 is odd, we just expand this guy out, and the crucial thing is that 2 squared is 4, but also 2 times 2 is 4. So that middle term, the 2ab term, and expanding the binomial, gives you 4. So you get something multiple of 4 plus 1, so that's 1 mod 4. And if you take odd plus odd, then you get a bunch of multiples of 4 plus 2. In all these cases, that's exha an exhaustive list, 3 never appears. Okay, so actually we could have said right at the start with this very basic analysis, we're never going to expect something of the form 4k plus 3 to be able to be expressible. Okay, so let's say it another way. Knowing that n is equal to 4k plus 1, it's, ne it's a necessary condition to be good if you're, if you're an odd number. And remember, we're only looking at odd primes at this point. Okay, that's a necessary condition. The interesting question is, suppose I know it's 4k plus 1, I know it's one congruent to 1 mod 4, it's very easy to determine, and it's prime, maybe less easy, but still, usually we know that. Is that sufficient to be good? Okay. Um, and in order to, to further that, we're going to actually take a little bit of it, what seems like a detour from the factoring approach and the Gaussian integer stuff. Um, but it's, it's going to feel a little different, but it's actually going to be a crucial way to crucial thing to combine with what we've seen already. One other thing that I want to ma mention, I don't think I wrote it down, but I want to make sure it comes in, in the videos, is a question about like what kinds of numbers are we going to expect it to be doing here. Um, uh, actually, no, you know what, I'll try and remember it later um, because it's just going to, I want to say one more thing. Okay, so we've got um, a very particular question. If uh, n is prime and one, congruent to 1 mod 4, is it the sum of squares? and we're going to be doing some interesting stuff in the next video.